Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Weber on or welcome to Weber Days at the Iowa City Public Library. During the month of May, which is almost at its completion, the library celebrates not only National Historic Preservation Month and local history, but also the local historian Irving B. Weber. Irving B. Weber lived his entire life, nearly all of the 20th century, in Iowa City. His family roots reached deep into early Iowa City. His maternal great-grandparents settled in Iowa City in 1839. His paternal grandparents came in 1857. Irving was born in 1900, the beginning of a new century. He went to Iowa City Public Schools and graduated from the University of Iowa in 1922. Irving Weber is remembered for many things. University of Iowa's first All-American swimmer, founder of Quality Check Dairy, serving as its president until his retirement in 1966. He was active in Iowa City, new, Iowa City host Noon Lions Club. In 1994, the Irving B. Weber Elementary School was named in his honor. He may be most remembered, though, for the, over the, eight, for the over 800 articles he wrote for the Iowa City Press Citizen, starting in 1973. His view of history was not one of dull retelling of facts and names. He shared the story of what it was like to grow up in Iowa City. The best places to buy penny candy, the joys of cooling off in Melrose Lake in the summer, sledding parties on closed off streets, he recorded for future generations the story of Iowa City as no one else could. All of the articles that Irving Weber wrote for the Iowa City Press Citizen are available online through the University of Iowa's Digital Library, a project made possible with the cooperation of the Iowa City host Lions Club, the Iowa City Public Library, and Lolly Eggers. All are linked to the Iowa City Public Library through our online catalog. Irving Weber died in 1997, barely missing a century of life. Join us for the rest of the month for more programs on Weber, Weber Days. I've been saying this over and over again, so there's only actually one program left tonight. Our final Weber on Wednesday, a WOW program, will be Tom Schulein, citizen historian, presenting a program on the history of Iowa City grocery stores, from the corner store to the superstore. Upstairs, what I like to call the best floor of the Iowa City Public Library, there is a fascinating display done by Friends of Historic Preservation sharing their 40-year history. You can take part in a scavenger hunt, learn more about Iowa City's historic districts, and see for yourself what downtown Iowa City looked like before urban renewal. We've also printed a number of images from our digital history collection, and as you came in, I gave you all a card, and it has the address of our digital history collection, history.icpl.org, so I invite you to explore that at home, and this program will be on there eventually, probably sometime next week. Today we are very fortunate to have Timothy Welch, Director Emeritus of the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, a former trustee of the State Historical Society, and a longtime member of the Iowa State Historical Records Advisory Board, share his new book, Images of America, Coralville, with us. Tim was educated at the University of Notre Dame and Northwestern University. He is the author or editor of 19 books, over 250 essays, newspaper columns and reviews. He is a frequent contributor to Iowa Heritage Illustrated, the quarterly magazine of the State Historical Society of Iowa. Please help me welcome Tim. Thanks, Maeve. Well, first let me tell you what I'm not, which of course is an authority on the history of Coralville. And as I stare out on this audience, I'm sure there are others who know as much or more but as often is the case with authors, when you're presented with a contract or an opportunity to write a book, you say, oh, why not? Well, of course, therein lies a tale. So that's somewhat of the tale of what we're going to tell today. Uh, and for those of you who can see the, the uh, cover, you'll, you'll uh, probably uh, have a, a sense of recognition, because even if you've never seen the Coralville book, you probably have seen others that look very similar to this. Uh, this book, of course, is produced by Arcadia Publishing, and kind of some of the basic facts of the book uh, need to be noted because there's something of a, a cookie cutter quality to them. I don't mean to denigrate the publisher, but they've produced over 10,000 local histories of neighborhood cities across the country and in fact recently purchased a company called History Press, which is an additional 3,000, so I'm told somewhere in the neighborhood of 13,000 uh, titles and rising. Uh, and in fact, although I've done, uh, as Mae mentioned, 19 books, I usually worked with editors at my publishers. In this case, at Arcadia, I worked with a title manager, uh, who I actually would rather uh, refer to as a border collie, because in effect, what he would do 
uh, would be to call me once a week and ask what kind of progress I made. And I began to realize that if you're going to manage 10,000 copies that are being produced by first-time authors or produced by committees, you're really going to have to stay on top of these people. So they keep to a pretty tight schedule. Well, this particular uh, book uh, has 11 chapters. The uh, Arcadia titles range from six chapters up to 11. 128 pages, all of them have 128 pages. The number of images in each book ranges from 180 as a minimum to 220 as a maximum. And I'm not estimating, that's exactly what they told me. So my particular book kind of comes in right at the middle at 198 images and 18,000 words in the form primarily of captions. Well, even though it is a slim book uh, and it's primarily of pictures, it does take a village to produce a book. Uh, and in this case, there are three villagers. Thank you, Maeve. There are three villagers who have uh, assisted me and to whom this book is dedicated. Uh, I wanted to uh, certainly uh, single out Alex Drayman at the uh, Johnson County Historical Society who not only helped locate the images that were available and it was no small challenge as you'll gather from what I have to say later uh, but also to Allison uh, Galstead at the Coralville Public Library and her technical staff they provided an office space and a scanner that allowed me to basically make the quality of image that was acceptable to Arcadia and then also Rex Brandstetter and I, I was just told actually that Rex is almost about to go on the air on his radio show talking about the history of Coralville. So I'm actually in competition in a different medium with my mentor, so to speak. But he is, as Kelly uh, Hayworth will tell you, Coralville's unofficial, or official unofficial historian, because if they made him the official historian, apparently there's some regulation or so Rex tells the story. But those three folks really made a difference, and without assistance, uh, I think no historian or author uh, can, uh, can go forward. We all benefit from the work of others. Well, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a trip through the book. Uh, the first chapter is called Founders, as uh, you might expect. And uh, if Coralville has any kind of father, so to speak, it would be Ezekiel Clark Sr., who was a landowner, an operator, who gave his last name to the original name for Coralville, which was Clarksville. Now, there had been a mill on the Iowa River, uh, approximately where uh, the Iowa River Power Company is now, as early as 1844. Uh, Clark and his partner, Samuel Kirkwood, uh, the governor, future governor, uh, purchased the mill after the operation had uh, uh, failed and reopened it about 1850 to serve farmers and merchants in the area. And they actually shared a home I'm going to show you, the, this is a, a map from about the 1873 era. You see how much land that, that Ezekiel Clark owns, Coralville now. So at this point, it's, it's renamed Coralville. It is eventually uh, incorporated in 1873. And you can see it's kind of obscure here. Woolen mill, paper mill, uh, and I think is that grain mill? Uh, and, and Clark owns, uh, flour mill, I'm sorry, yeah, Clark owns more of the land over there. Uh, the name was changed to Coralville after a visit following, uh, not directly following, but in later years after a visit by Louis Agassiz, who was a professor of geology at uh, Harvard University, who was taken to the area around the mill and shown the bedrock. And he said, well, this is Devonian era uh, coral reefs. Uh, and in fact, they then chose to name, uh, rename the property Coralville. And to the best of my research, it is the only Coralville in the United States and may perhaps be the only Coralville in the world. So that is a unique distinction that few communities that can claim. Uh, large generational, multi-generational families were common in Coralville. This is the, uh, the James Painton family. Uh, he is right here. Uh, and uh, with his son-in-law, Edward Kozer, you may have heard of, remember, Kozer's Store, which was at the corner of uh, First Avenue and Fifth Street. Uh, and he is the husband of Harriet Painton. Uh, so multi-generational families uh, settled Coralville initially. The Paintons, James Painton, came to Coralville with his wife uh, from England, with his wife and two sons and brother in 1882. He worked as a carpenter and served as mayor of Coralville for five years. Now, his son-in-law, Edward, 
also served as mayor, in fact, served the longest term thus far as mayor for uh, more than 32 years. He became mayor in 1903 and served until his passing in 1935. There was a second generation of founders, uh, and this is a little bit of an homage to Rex. These are his, Rex Brandstetter, these are his grandparents, Genevieve and Joseph Brandstetter, and I wanted to articulate them. They're both in the book, uh, or this picture, I should say, is in the book, but I wanted to articulate their contribution because Genevieve served as town treasurer from 1943 to 1959, and Brandy, as he was known, served as the town marshal from 1937 to 1951, and Clearly a community of this size where there's only a few hundred people uh, from the time it was incorporated in 1873 until really 1950, it meant that you were dependent on volunteers. And these were two uh, volunteers. And they were, of course, very proud of the fact of having the first telephone in uh, Coralville Heights. What is Coralville Heights? Coralville Heights is a part of Coralville that uh, is, I think, now fully incorporated into the city. But it was a designated area at the time. So. Uh, th that was, uh, that was a, a designation where they pr built their home. The second chapter is, uh, is the river, uh, and different seasons brought different obligations and opportunities for Coralville residents. Summer brought a unique set of opportunities, both income and entertainment. This is one of the excursion boats that would cruise up and down the Iowa River below the Coralville Dam during warm summer months. You get a chance to see that. There are some wonderful pictures of, of recreation. And then, of course, the river has not always been kind to Coralville and Iowa City uh, and, and all the communities downriver. The power of the river and the damage that it can do is very evident in this picture, taken right at the dam there. Uh, in this picture, the river has overtaken the overhead dam and the water is on its way to flood Iowa City. And of course, everything that was floating uh, in the river above the dam would get caught in the dam. There's a picture in the book of the Coralville Queen, one of the excursion boats that got loose and jammed itself into the dam. Now in the 1940s, the Corps of Engineers devised a plan to build a dam on the Iowa River north of Coralville. This is a brochure prepared in 1955. I think it's a wonderful line illustration, so I wanted to include it. Um, and there are other pictures in the book as well from the, the brochure. The engineers believe that the reservoir with an outflow capacity of 10,000 cubic feet of water per second would be more than sufficient to prevent flooding downriver. And that was the case until 1993 when spring and summer rains overflowed the reservoir and even more perilous flooding took place in 2008 causing a billion dollars worth of damage. Chapter three is on industry. Operating a dam and several mills was a never-ending process of repair and rebuilding. This photograph captures the paper mill, the grain mill. Uh, the paper mill is right here. This is the grain mill uh, and the dam in a peaceful sort of idyllic moment after the dam has been repaired in the early 1890s. Behind the mills in the background are a number of smaller structures that were early homes of uh, men who worked at the mills. The, uh, the next chapter, or excuse me, the, the uh, next slide focuses on, uh, uh, excuse me, lost my, oh, although mills uh, offered steady employment for a few men, many more were engaged in farming. Most farmers planted uh, grains such as corn, oats, wheat, and took advantage of their proximate, proximity to the coral mill to produce flour for sale in Iowa City. These fa uh, farmers also raised and sold vegetables uh, to local grocers, raised livestock for meat and dairy products. This is George Prohoda who farmed in the Coralville area. By the turn of the 20th century, uh, the dominant industry on the river was shifting from milling to electric power for Iowa City and Coralville. The power company opened in 1886, was rebuilt in 1894, and again after a fire in 1899. Other challenges, flooding among them, required various changes over the years. This is a picture of a, the renovated plant about 1940, and it continued to provide power to the area until 1968, and of course, now it's a restaurant. 
Other industries came to Coralville in the 1920s and 30s. In 1920, the River Products Company came to the community to take advantage of rich stone deposits that formed the city's bedrock. Geological examination revealed that Coralville limestone was of unusually high quality for the area, similar to the best along the Mississippi and Missouri, uh, uh, Mississippi River in Missouri and Illinois. And this uh, picture shows quarry operations in the 1960s. Now you can tell that the, the technical quality of this picture, which came from, lest we forget, the centennial history of Coralville, we could not locate the original picture. And so we're still looking for good pictures of industry uh, in Coralville, particularly river products, but uh, other industries as well. The next chapter, four, is on commerce. The close ties between Coralville and Iowa City were evident in a number of local products, not the least of which were flour and ice. The picture here is an advertising card that promoted finely milled flour to meet various baking needs. As one might expect, flour was marketed through a store in downtown uh, Iowa City. Uh, the the uh, newspaper at the time it was the Iowa City Press. I don't know if I say it here. Um, the Iowa City Press. Uh, heralded the opening of the first mill before the Clark uh, Kirkwood operation uh, with the headline who, saying, who wants bread? Because the importance of finely milled flour was, uh, was very significant in culture at the time. I like also best in the world, right? <laughs> of course, okay. Kozer's store was something of an anchor in Coralville, which had only a few hundred residents living within the city limits until 1950. Kids who were bored could pedal their bikes over to Kozers to buy a cold pop, bottle of pop, or penny candy. In fact, Kozers was something of a community center where people could get the news or warm up before they caught the interurban, the, the Crandick, on a cold day. Can you tell us where that is? Like That's at the corner of 5th Street and 1st Avenue, right across from the power company. It's now really an empty lot. Uh, there was, I think, a law office there and, and some... Uh, the city, I think, owns the property now, and they're, they're going to develop the area. It's across from Riverview Square, which I think was also a gas station in a previous lifetime. So there's been a lot, excuse me, a lot of change during that time. And of course, it's amazing when you think we've gone from this to this in a century. Uh, not quite literally in the same location, but you can see the growth, obviously, of Coralville that makes the difference between 1903 and 2003. This photograph captures the built environment of commercial Coralville. The area was populated with motels and restaurants intended to serve tens of thousands of cars going east and west on the interstate. Now, this picture was taken in 1999, shortly after the opening of Coral Ridge Mall, which was at the time the largest shopping center in the state of Iowa. The next chapter is on travel. Now until, two th uh, excuse me, until 1914, travel in and around Coralville was by foot, by horse, or by rail. Many children walked to the Coralville school each day, uh, and their parents used the family horse to go to Iowa City for supplies. Roads were often muddy, and it made travel an adventure to say the least. This is Raymond Cole, uh, and he lived on a farm uh, on 12th Street. It's a wonderful picture, and so I definitely wanted to use that. This will be familiar to a few people. In August of 1903, a special election was held in Coralville to decide whether or not the Cedar Rapids and Iowa City Railway Company, or better known as Crandick, would stop in Coralville. The vote was 35 in favor and three against. <laughs> Just shows you how many people were living in Coralville. Farmers were eager to have this stop because it allowed them to ship meat, dairy products, and vegetables to Iowa City every day. The cost of travel on the train was a dime each way. The service was popular until it was eclipsed by hard surface roads and automobiles, and the service ended in 1953. And this is a picture of the Coralville Station. Which is where? I'm not sure where the Coralville Station, do you, either of you know, remember where it was, exactly the specific location? The tracks are still there. You can see the tracks uh, going <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> that's right, yeah, that's right. Um, but I don't have a specific location for the... On the on the post, oh, can you see a street? Where I'm not sure where you see it. Right there. Here. Well, yeah, there. The 
as I get closer, it becomes, <laughs> it becomes digitized. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Okay, beginning in the middle of the 19-teens, cars and motorcycles could be seen daily on the roads of Coralville. This is the Wenman family. Uh, Hank Wenman worked at River Products Company for 33 years, and he drove a vehicle called the Dinky, the small engine that took crushed limestone from the quarry to the Rock Island Depot for shipment. This is the Wenman family with, this is Hank Wenman with his wife, Laura, and two of their 11 children. I'm sure not all 11 fit in that car, but <laughs> this is perhaps a Sunday drive. Governance is the sixth chapter, and I start with a picture of a very modest building that was initially constructed as the Ecclesiastical Union Church, which became Coralville's Town Hall in 1921. Improvements were made to the building in 1953 with the addition of water and plumbing. So from 21 to 53, there was no uh, uh, facilities, uh, shall we say, in City Hall. The building continued as City Hall until 1974 when a new municipal building was opened behind the fire station. In 2014, the historic building was moved to a location across the street from the 1876 schoolhouse. Uh, it is not yet finished, so it's not yet reopened. The new city hall opened in 1974, and the following year, the council passed a home rule bill, rule bill that strengthened the mayor's job description and gave the position greater responsibility and administrative authority. At the same time, the council staggered the terms of city councilors to provide more continuity of leadership on the council. And during the last quarter of the century, the council wrestled with a myriad of issues that resulted from the city's spectacular growth. And it did seem, after 1960, it just seemed to grow like topsy. Coralville's Volunteer Fire Department was formed in 1929. Uh, the first firehouse was a garage that was rented from Mayor Kozer, and the force consisted of four volunteers. The department, like the city, continued to grow over the next several decades. Indeed, as the city's commercial district expanded, the risk of fire increased. This is a picture taken during the 1964 fire at Econogas. Uh, several employees were burned, but the department rose to the occasion and saved 30,000 gallons of liquid propane from destruction. The recent direction and growth of Coralville has been a collaboration of a number of dynamic leaders who faced both challenges and opportunities over the past 25 years. This is Mayor Jim Fawcett and City Administrator Kelly Hayworth at the dedication of the Marriott Hotel and Convention Center in 2006. Of the center and the landing has been an anchor uh, for the development of professional offices and commercial enterprises. Chapter 7 is on education. And this is the earliest known picture of the Coralville School. One student uh, who remembered her education in that building uh, recalled that in 1905, mischievous children were required to sit on a dunce stool and face the corner and wear the pointed cap. Uh, that was uh, her memory of it. Uh, this uh, community, has, the community was very proud of the schoolhouse, which quickly became a community center for student plays and other gatherings. There were numerous pictures taken of this building, and I dare say within the uh, archives or the collections of the Johnson County Historical Society, there's probably no topic or subject for which there are more pictures than the Coralville School. So I had no shortage of Coralville School pictures. Um, and it was uh, used in a variety of different ways for multiple generations of children. Uh, Rex tells the story too, and, and we'll, we'll see pictures of the schoolhouse uh, later on, that it's unusual because it is a two-story schoolhouse and it's a brick schoolhouse. And that was not typical of uh, one room or small schoolhouses uh, in Iowa in the 19th century. Um, as Coralville continued to grow, one elementary school was not enough. In fact, it was clear that there was a need for a separate school building for the seventh and eighth graders, even when they were still occupying the, uh, the, the, the 1876 schoolhouse. So in 1849, of course, they added Coralville Central, what is now called Coralville Central. Uh, some Coralville citizens believed the city could finance and administer its own school system, but the majority voted to merge its schools with the Iowa City Community Schools. This is the Northwest Junior High School uh, about the time of its opening in 1972. And after graduating from junior high, Coralville students chose where they would attend uh, high school. 
Uh, within the confines of education or the rubric, I've also included libraries, and the Coralville Library traces its origin to a special meeting of the Coralville City Council in April of 1965. So they're celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. Fundraising started with a bake sale sponsored by the Girl Scouts and progressed from that modest start. When the library outgrew a room in the basement of City Hall, the City Council purchased and remodeled the Fessler Building uh, as a library and uh, Parks and Recreation Department. They divided the building. Some of the work was done by volunteers, as is seen in this picture. This is the original 1876 schoolhouse at the time of its 1983 rededication as the Museum of the Johnson County Historical Society. Uh, the celebration of the uh, conversion of the schoolhouse into a museum was marked by the first of what is now the annual Fourth Fest celebrations. Chapter 8 is on recreation. This is a great picture of members of the Chris family. I don't know specifically which ones. Coralvillians worked hard at the mill on the farm and at school, and they also enjoyed all forms of recreation. Baseball was only one of many recreational activities sponsored by both private and public organizations in the city. Mayor Merritt Ewalt appointed the first Recreation Commission in 1951, and facilities and programs were added almost yearly. A gymnasium at Coralville Central School was used for a variety of activities. Organized baseball also came to Coralville in the mid-1950s with Little League teams, a Babe Ruth program, and a girls softball league. This is about the 1920s. We'll sit there too. During July and August, Coralville residents, such as Frank Allwine, operated small excursion boats on the Iowa River and transported families to Picnic Hollow. Now, I don't know where Picnic Hollow is, but the, the scrapbook from which these came was a Coralville resident. It keeps referring to Picnic Hollow, so clearly there is a place, uh, at least for a time, uh, for an afternoon of food and relaxation away from summer heat. To be sure no one took the river for granted, spring and summer rains could turn the river into a monster, and it's also true, uh, but it's also true that Coralville residents deeply enjoyed the Iowa River when it was calm. In addition to recreation of a typical sort, there were other forms. One prominent and notorious venue was the Iowa City Drive-In Movie Theater. When investors agreed to finance the drive-in, they were concerned that the public would not respond to a theater called the Coralville Drive-In Theater. So they named their venue the Iowa City Drive-In Theater. The questionable name did not bother the owners, but it remained a sore spot for Coralvillians. And if you ever, if you know Rex, just ask him the story and he'll get red in the face. Continue to, and of course, it, it's even more notorious, I, I suppose I can say this, uh, if, if I'm careful, and that is when, when uh, the fortunes of the drive-in theater began to decline and not as many people came to the theater, the owners uh, made a decision to show uh, uh, pictures of, uh, of questionable taste. Many of them were, were uh, somewhat salacious. Uh, of course, the problem was that these large images of scantily clad women could be seen from uh, the, the bedroom windows of young boys in the neighborhood behind the theater. And I think that led to the, to the demise of the theater. Uh, uh, but uh, this is at its beginning, at its, 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 perhaps it's a point of hope. Hospitality, of course, we think of Coralville, we think of hospitality. Uh, uh, Cor hospitality in Coralville, which is chapter nine, began really in the middle of the 1850s, depending on how you define it, with the arrival of several thousand Mormons. The immigrants had arrived by train in Iowa City and needed a place of respite before they continued their trek to Utah. They settled on the banks of Clear Creek and devoted their time to building handcarts similar to the one depicted here. Seven companies of Mormons left Coralville to walk 1,400 miles to the Great Salt Lake. Uh, after 1857, however, the handcart plan was abandoned. Uh, and there are some people who believe actually that they uh, used the handcarts for just a, a you know, a moderate amount of distance and then you know, took other, other forms of transportation to get to Salt Lake. Uh, it is uh, hard to overvalue the importance of the Blue Top Motels to many visitors to Coralville. Uh, the appeal had a lot to do with the welcoming demeanor of the Lawrence Smith family, as well as the fact that each of the cottages had the ambience of a small home away from home. 
The cottages were clean, quiet, and most important, had kitchenettes that allowed visitors to cook for themselves. The Blue Top had the recommendation of the American Automobile Association and was even the subject of a pictorial homage published in 2003. In 1967, Coralville held a contest to create a slogan for the city. There it is. Is that what you were thinking of? Yeah. And Right there. There's a wonderful collection, and the, and there's a book called The Strip, which was done about 1985, which includes a, a selection of photographs uh, taken by Karen Becker of uh, facilities up and down uh, First Avenue and Second Street, uh, and it's I don't know if the book's still available here. It's certainly at the the Johnson County Historical Society. But the carousel was also the location where Lowry's was, the drive-in restaurant where folks could go, drive up to a slot, and then folks would come out and take, uh, take their order. Um, the, uh, the, the zoning, of course, meant that you had all kinds of, of signage. Um, it, was the, uh, it was crowned uh, in 1967 by contest, the hub of hospitality. The slogan captured the positive view of the expansive, expansive growth of restaurants and motels that had popped up along Highway 6 and 1st Avenue. Coralville was pleased with the tax revenues that came from the result of all the visitors uh, who, of course, uh, stayed in the motels and ate at the restaurants, but dismayed at the rather tacky mishmash of signage that seemed to accompany these facilities or these institutions. Yes, there's a lot. There's a lot we see here that no longer exists, you know? Reasonable rates, made right, yeah, it's a sort of a, and, and that's one of the benefits, too, of, of taking a look at some of these pictures, from, even from the 80s, is, wow, there's a lot that's changed in Coralville. Service is the 10th of 11 chapters. Service comes to Coralville fairly early on in the person of Elizabeth Dennis, who is sitting on the lower right in this picture uh, of the Iowa City Soldiers Aid Society of the Civil War. She was the daughter of Nathaniel Fellows, one of the earliest of Coralville's uh, settlers. Elizabeth was actively involved in serving her neighbors, her church, the American Red Cross, and the young men who gave so much in the Civil War and every war thereafter until World War I. So Elizabeth is right here. Service came to the city in a variety of forms of organizations and individuals, and this picture captures the patriotism and resolve of Bill and Gordon Dinsmore as they prepare to ship out service to their nation. After the war, the Dinsmore family donated the land for the American Legion post in Coralville and remained active in support of veterans, uh, among other uh, civic gestures. You can see there are 82 Coralvillians uh, sent uh, men to service in World War II or the Korean conflict. I don't have statistics for, uh, sir, I think it's seven in World War I, and I don't have it for wars after uh, Coralville. Scouting movement had a long and distinguished history in Coralville. The Girl Scouts were organized in Coralville in the spring of 1944, and a Brownie troop started in the fall of 1947. Both the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts have been active in a broad range of service projects that have improved the quality of life uh, in Coralville. And this was actually a presentation of a check to the, uh, Johnsonville, uh, the uh, Johnson County Historical Society, I believe. Service is heralded and remembered in Coralville. Firefighting, of course, is recognized uh, through the statewide Iowa Firefighters Memorial located adjacent to Oak Hill Cemetery. The memorial remembers the sacrifice of hundreds of volunteer firefighters who have stepped forward to serve in this vital role in their respective community. Celebration is the last chapter in this book. Um, the earliest celebrations in Coralville came in the 19th century and were based at home and at school. Coralville school children were taught to be proud of their country and the values expressed in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and this is, as you can see there, the earliest picture of a 4th of July celebration. This is the home of Joseph Hemphill, taken on July 4th of 1899. So this is 4th Fest in its infancy. 4th Fest Parade was an opportunity for Coralville to come out and thank those who made their lives better, individuals who helped define the quality of life in their community. 
In this photograph from the mid-1990s, three key staff members from the Coralville Public Library were honored for their 75 years of service. From the left uh, is Jean Schwab, uh, Pauline Lovtinsky, and Fran Rogers. I was looking for more pictures, and we need more pictures of the Isle of Light and the uh, Christmas celebrations. Each year in the weeks before Christmas, the city of Coralville, as well as many of its residents, collectively decorate their community for the holidays. Trees along Highway 6 are lit up like a fairyland, and individual homeowners fill their yards with all manner of decorations. Uh, on a specified evening each year, residents put out candle luminaries and invite residents to enjoy the holidays. This is the home of Dave and Roxanne Bonson. Okay, and my last formal card here. <laughs> Coralville Pride was manifest in other ways as well. This is the kickoff ceremony for Fry Fest, now an annual celebration of legendary coach Hayden Fry and the beginning of the new season of Hawkeye football. Coralville renamed First Avenue as Hayden Fry Way in honor of the coach. And you can see the coaches here. Look for those telltale sunglasses, right? So. And Herky, of course, yes, that's right. Uh, the book, um, of course, started out by talking about Arcadia. Arcadia is magnificent in terms of its efforts to put a book in the hands of just about anybody who goes into any kind of commercial establishment. And anywhere magazines are sold, or even where nuts and bolts are sold, you're likely to find a rack that sells Arcadia books. So it is available uh, for sale at the public library, Corville Public Library in the Convention and Visitors Bureau, and of course Barnes and Noble, but also Walgreens, Ace Hardware, Hy-Vee, and of course at Prairie Lights. So if you, uh, if you feel uh, you're interested in taking a look at the book, I have a copy here you can also take a look at. Uh, this is the library's copy. It's for reference purposes only. <laughs> now, where do we go from here? What's next? Well, as, as I've said to other groups, this book is hardly uh, definitive, and it's not perfection. It is the best of the four or 500 pictures that I was able to locate related to Coralville. And I'm hoping that it's something of a challenge because as we approach this, the uh, sesquicentennial of Coralville in 2023, uh, and no doubt there will be an effort to do a more complete history, there will be a need for a more complete record of photographs. And with digital technology, as, uh, as Maeve mentioned about what, what Iowa City is doing, this can be done in Coralville, and there is an interest on the part of the public library in Coralville, and the Johnson County Historical Society to digitize more uh, photographs. So as you hear of people who have collections in their attics or basements or in their upper parts of their closets, encourage them to uh, contact the public library or contact me, and I have cards you can give out to them, uh, to, uh, to let us know so that we can arrange to have digital images of those photographs. Uh, in addition to the general awareness that we're trying to raise about Coralville history, uh, Gary Frost, who some of you know from the, the uh, uh, University of Iowa Book Conservation Department, now retired, is developing a bicycle tour of historic Coralville. And some of the pictures that are in the book will also show up in the brochure. And I think he's going to uh, roll that out about the same time everyone rolls into town for uh, Ragbri. Uh, and as I said, we'll keep planning for the, the Coralville uh, sesquicentennial in 2003, and we hope also that, that it encourages uh, anyone who sees the program or reads the book to support the public library, the Iowa City Public Library, as well as the Coralville Public Library and the Johnson County Historical Society, because each of you is your own historian, you're a local historian, and supporting these kinds of programs and institutions is vital if we're going to understand the community in which we live. Okay, well now we can take a few questions if you have anything. Wait. We're going to wait. So we are recording this, and um, so when you have a question, I'm going to hand you the, the microphone. But since I have it right now, I'm going to start with my question. Yes. And what was the, the most interesting photograph you found, and why was it the most interesting one? I, I wish I could say something pops right into my mind. Um, I suppose as I organized the book, what what surprised me the most is how much the river is the central player in Coralville. It, it could be Riverville as well as Coralville because it's not so much the bedrock but the power of the river uh, and not just in the summer. It's not just when the river flowed but it was also in the winter. It's the ice companies 
There's only two good pictures of, of ice harvest, and there really needs to be more because there were two major ice houses. I know the Alwines had one and the Kozers had one. I know there are a lot of stories, oral history stories, stories about people, where they lived, what they did, uh, stories that people like Rex Branstetter has, but others too, older Coral Villians, and I wish we had a better record or an effort to record those. So that's a, a long way around to get the river, anything, and there are a lot of pictures of the river. Not enough pictures, however, of the flooding of 2008. So the, the contemporary Coralville, you know, we're growing so fast, we're not documenting what we're doing. So, so the, the, the two ends of, of our history, the very beginning, the first 50 years, and the last 25. Bernie? Uh, two things. Uh, first of all, just mentioning the floods. Uh, I have had a friend who was uh, a minor partner in the Wigan and Penn. Mm -hmm. And on July 4th, I happened to be working uh, that morning, and the phone rang, and I answered, and what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just catching up. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, we're getting ready to open a restaurant out in Coralville, a pizza restaurant or something. He said, stop on out and have some pizza. And I said, well, where is it? Well, it was the Wigan and Penn. The next day, it was under about three feet of water. <laughs> uh, the reason I wanted to ask a, a, a not very important question, but a curiosity, you talked about the city hall and yes. that they recently moved it. Why did they set it cockeyed on that lot? It doesn't line up with the street. I, I, I have, it's, it's an excellent question, but you know, I've driven by that maybe a 40 times and I haven't noticed that it was cockeyed to the lot. So I, I don't know. And, and in fact, uh, it's a good question for somebody to stand up at a meeting of the city council in Coralville saying, you need to move that building. It's driving me crazy. I'll, I'll put Rex on the spot. Yes, that's right. That's right. Could you pass that? I, I actually have, is it on? Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, we can okay. hear you. I, I, it doesn't give feedback. Anyway, um, speaking of a couple things you brought up, um, starting with the 2008 floods, it would be nice to find pictures. Um, I live off of Foster Road, and in 2008 we um, had to evacuate. And so I went uh, with, originally I went to, and you can help me on this, but it's the, the motel that's right behind, I think it's a BP just off of, First Avenue, or yeah, First Avenue, and um, very well-known one. What? No, it was on the other side. I, uh, well, Bayside Inn sounds right. Well, anyway, out the back of it is just a dead-end street goes in there, and a lot of small businesses like uh, Harley repair shops and stuff. Anyway, that um, that whole corner, as people probably know. Um, including that Riverview Square that you mentioned, they were under a tremendous amount of water. And um, I mean, this, I think it was the Baymont Inn, it was kind of a center of activity. If you looked out towards the, I guess it's gonna be west, um, that little dead end street there, I mean, people were having to boat on it and all of this were all of the, uh, um, rem remedial work was centered, and so, for what it's worth, if you could get pictures of that, it was pretty amazing. I think that there, those pictures exist, and I'm confident that people do have digital images of what happened. Many of them probably, it would be hard to articulate the depth of the water in, in many cases. I mean, I think the pictures that that tend to have the greatest power are those pictures that show the water that's roiling as it hits those dams and really, uh, you know, regurgitates or, 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 or yeah. turns over. Um, but, but again, the power of, of urban flooding, I mean, we're obviously seeing it this week in Houston, but, you know, we, we've already lived that life and we know how powerful, you know, the whole notion in, in 19th century, 18th century development is live proximate to a source of water you know, preferably a river where you can also use it for, for transport. And now the river has become questionable as to, to its value in our lives. You know, it's like... It's Actually, like a, now that I think of it, I think I know where you can get some pictures of that. And it was the small little 
ticky tacky shops yeah. around there. I mean, the water was like but eight you know, feet we deep. Don't, and we don't have good pictures of the shops. We have a few, thanks to Karen Becker, of say one or two of Randall's, which is now gone. We have a few of the picture of, of, of the, the shops in Lantern Park, but not a lot. So there's a lot of everyday, ordinary, built environment in Coralville that just hasn't been recorded, and that's really from 1950 on, and I'm guessing most people had a box camera. I'm less, you know, uh, uh, I, I have fewer expectations about the first two decades of the 20th century, but I have high expectations for the period from 1950, say, to 1980, about which we don't have anywhere near enough pictures or stories, for that matter. I will say, lest we forget, which has got problems and errors in it, but by gosh, they certainly did a, an excellent job of trying to bring together as much information they had, and that was published in 1973, and copies, I think, are still available for sale at the uh, Johnson County Historical Society. So. Um, in 1971, I lived in Lantern Park, although they didn't really call it that at the time, at least not that I knew of. Right. Those apartments lining right. the street right, what would that be, north? Um, yeah, 19th. And um, in the evening, I like to take walks, and so I, I went up and I went down what's now 5th Street. Mm -hmm. and. You know, I like history, and I'm just kind of a snoop anyway. And there was a little, right where the park is now, that's right next to City Hall, there was a little um, stone monument, very small. But it was um, a monument to the uh, Mormon oh, sure. people. And they've since moved it, I guess. Yep. But uh, I thought that was fascinating. It was the first understanding that I had of the Mormon contribution to this area. There is one picture of the, of the monument that's in the book, and as far as I know, it's the only picture that exists. I've only seen it. And again, it was published in uh, Lest We Forget. Uh, so in fact, that line drawing that I showed came from Lest We Forget. So there's a number of pictures. Thank goodness, basically what they did was they cut up the printer's negative. So the original pictures, as far as I know, don't exist. But we have the negative that the printer used to produce the book. So uh, it's, it's got a, a heavy dot matrix to it, so we did try to improve the quality, and we think we did a pretty good job. But, but again, a lot of these, uh, these activities, we don't have decent pictures of uh, not the original post office, but the, the one that we just replaced, the one at the corner of 5th uh, uh, Str uh, uh, Street and 10th, and 10th tenth and 5th. No pictures. We should. We should have pictures inside and out. You know, it's again, it's a whole question of, well, why would you take the other? Here's another wonderful source that takes somebody who's willing to spend the time. The State Historical Society of Iowa here in Iowa City has the photo negatives of the press citizen from 1945 or so to the mid 1970s. They are stored in boxes. There's no finding aid. They're just negatives by date. If somebody would go through the microfilm of the press citizen, and look on the front page and then page usually three or five, you know, where you have another human interest pictures, you could pick up which dates had a Coralville photograph in it of somebody, do, and they are, they're wonderful human interest or, you know, news, local news pictures. We could have a copy or scan that negative and produce, but boy, that's, you know, that's somebody spending a lot of time at a microfilm reader looking at uh, that film. So anyway, excuse me, go ahead. Oh, I think someplace in the, uh What's next? It uh, would be interesting to know. Uh, you had one picture of the Coralville fire truck in yes. there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say today, I would venture a guess that Coralville may be the largest uh, city in the nation and the one that has the most value of real estate to have basically a volunteer, volunteer fire, fire department. department. It could. Uh, one one, yeah, could very one well. university official I used to work with, uh, you know, I'm coming to them that they were talking about all their property. Yeah. I said, well, Coralville has a fire volunteer fire department, basically. They well, just the, in, in this so, state. So, so the culture that, sure. made, that made that happen exactly. and, and sustains it today would exactly. be pretty interesting, yeah. I think. No, it, and it starts out, there's, as far as I know, only one or two pictures of the earliest iterations of Coralville equipment. I know I've got one picture of a hose cart, I think, other than that. But again, where are the pictures from the 20s and, or say, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s? Uh, before the Oconagas, I mean, some of these are, came from wrecks, and some of them are, are fortunately at the historic study, but not enough. So, 
I'm going to finish off with, with just one last memory of Coralville. So when I was an undergraduate in the late 1970s, we would go to Dick Meyer's truck stop. Okay, sure. And where was the location of the truck stop? It's... So at the beginning of the Iowa landing, and yeah. I, I wonder if Dick, Dick would have some photographs of that, because that was an institution that had great breakfast on... Yeah, it was a wonderful place yeah. to go. Yeah, and there's, the, oh, we do have a picture of Dick in here, but even getting pictures of Dick, who was, he was mayor for, I think, two years, and then obviously on the Coralville City Council, and then state legislature and county supervisor, you think, well, there's got to be lots and lots of pictures. Or Russell Slade, who, example, was critical to. And I, we had to go to Dolores, and all we got was a headshot that was taken, you know, I think for a wedding anniversary. And we, where are all the pictures? You know, the, well, they said, well, maybe I've got some more, but I've got to wait for the kids to come. Well, you know, and then the kids come after mom gets sick and they throw stuff out. You know, I was, I've been doing this for 40 years where people are throwing things out or the next generation throws things out. But in, in many ways, and just as a plug for the Iowa City Public Library and probably the Coralville Library, we, the Noon Lions Club, mm -hmm. has a Weber fund and that money's been growing. And we recently purchased a, a large archival scanner. Right. And so you can scan things. It's not a difficult thing to do. And it's got a tray that fits on top of it for slides, which I think lots yes. of people of our generations have many, many slides and not very many people have slide projectors any longer. So there is a way to save those things. And it really is important. Some of the photographs are so important, not only because of the people in them, but what's in the background, because that's where yes. you can find what the buildings were and what the streets looked like. So thank you very much, Tim. This was a wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.